Welcome everybody, good evening. My name is Rafael Ortega and I am the Ramsey County Commissioner for District 5, which includes uh, Highland, Grove, West 7th, uh, downtown area, uh, the West Side among other neighborhoods. I'd like to welcome you today to the uh, first virtual open house for the Riverview uh, Corridor. This is the second phase of our work. And it's, uh, it's gonna be a critical piece of work and I'm glad to see that so many people are attending. This corridor is gonna be very important for St. Paul in the future. It connects downtown with the airport and the uh, Mall of America, but it also will connect people to jobs and education and healthcare services. Uh, I do want everybody to, to uh, put their best foot forward and participate. You know, for many of you who are veterans to, to sometimes step back and allow uh, those that are new to the process and maybe to participating in these type of public events to step up and please ask questions. There's no, uh, there's no bad questions. They're all, all the questions are good and I don't care if they've been repeated, ask them again and make sure that you understand the answers that you are getting. Uh, my assistant Ken Ioso is here and he will be uh, uh, tracking the process also with me and uh, certainly you're free to call him and, uh, and ask questions. Uh, we want to make sure that this process is one where the community, businesses and all folks uh, get to provide input. We want this corridor to at the end of the day not only provide uh, a great transit, but uh, to be make the neighborhood safer uh, and hopefully more beautiful and beautification should be part of this process too. So thank you very much for attending and uh, I look forward to uh, meeting with all of you in person down the road as we have more open houses. I will now uh, turn it over to uh, Kevin. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Commissioner Ortega. Uh, I'm, I'm, my name is Kevin Roggenbuck. I'm a senior transportation planner with Ramsey County Public Works. Uh, I'm working on the Riverview project. I manage the uh, project management consultant contract and the community, uh, community engagement and communications contract as well. Uh, so I'll be kind of helping facilitate the beginning part of this meeting. And at now at this time, I'd like to, uh, before we start the meeting, I'll read the land acknowledgement uh, in, in order to honor the native people who lived here before we arrived. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land since time immemorial. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We are standing on the ancestral lands of the Dakota people. We want to acknowledge the Ojibwe, the Ho-Chunk, and other nations of people who called this place home. We pay respects to their elders, past and present. Please take a moment to consider the treaties made by the tribal nations that entitle non-Native people to live and work on traditional Native lands. Consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. Thank you. I'll, I'll run through a few things about meeting format and purpose, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, the meeting format is essentially our agenda for tonight. Uh, we'll complete the welcome and I'll, I'll give some information on, on how the meeting will be, will be run and how you can participate. We'll have a project overview that will largely cover the work that was done previously in the pre-project development study and how we arrived at the locally preferred alternative, Modern Streetcar, generally along West 7th Street. Uh, we'll have some information about where are we now. As you know, we've been working on the next phase of work, refining and, and defining the locally preferred alternative and resolving a lot of uh, issues associated with making that project, project work and fit in our area, in our project area. We'll speak to you about planning for station areas, essentially stationary planning and the number of, of new stations that would, that would be built as part of this project along West 7th Street in St. Paul and understanding history and culture. We'll have information about that as well, uh, knowing that the, the, the river corridor is, is rich in Native American history and a lot of other history along the corridor from our, our, our European settlers who settled St. Paul. 
Uh, finally, we'll, we'll have uh, information about engaging the public in the project and ask for your input on how we're, how we're doing, how we're engaging you, and, and, and what best ways that we can engage you uh, in this process. And then finally, we'll, at, we'll answer your questions at the end of the meeting. As we go through the presentation, uh, I invite you to put questions. In, oh, I'm sorry, I'll cover that a little bit later. But uh, on the meeting, per yeah, here. Sorry, Michael. On, on the next slide, there. Yeah, our meeting purpose: we'll share information about the Riverview Quarter Modern Streetcar Project with you. Uh, we'll also share information about the draft purpose and need. This is an item that's out for public review right now through the end of the week. It's specific to the to the Riverview project, so we'll share information about that with you. We want to answer your questions about about the project, and we want to get your feedback on the draft purpose and need as well. Uh, Public comments and questions, as I mentioned, will be taken at the end of the presentation. Uh, we will ask you poll questions during the pro at, at the end of each section. We'll stop and pause. We'll ask you a quick poll question. A, a box will pop up, and you can answer that poll question for us quickly, uh, just to kind of engage you, and so you're not just listening to us speak for for so long. Uh, then at the end of the presentation, we'll take your questions. And as you as you listen to us present information to you, please insert your questions into the question and answer box. That's that little highlighted yellow uh, Q&A portion down there at the bottom. So please uh, insert your questions there and we'll get to them at the end of the meeting. Uh, and we'll read it. Okay, here's some group agreements. Uh, this applies probably more to in-person meetings, but it also applies here to this virtual meeting as well. Uh, we want you to be open-minded. I know some of you have lived in the corridor for a very long time and you may have said opinions about the project, that's okay, but please be open-minded uh, and listen actively and respectively when others are sharing their comments and when we're responding to their comments and when the presenters are speaking as well. Speak from your own experience instead of generalizing and, and kind of assuming that your opinion is shared by uh, universally by other groups. We respectfully ask that uh, you give us challenging questions but refrain from personal attacks. We'll answer any questions you have about the project uh, and, and want to share that information with you tonight. We want you to be engaged and provide feedback. Uh, don't just listen to us, be sure to answer questions. We want you to leave this meeting feeling informed and feeling that whatever questions on your mind were, were answered, or at least that we've tried to respond to them in, in a way that you can, you can take back with you and feel good about being part of this meeting. The goal is not always to agree, it's to gain a deeper understanding. We're not trying to convince you of anything here, we're just trying to share information with you and get your feedback on the project. We want you to be aware of your facial expressions. If you have your camera on, they can be perceived as, as disrespectful as words to, to, other, to the presenters and to other, other people enjoying or in, engaging in this, in this meeting. Uh, do not dominate the discussion, allow others to be heard. Uh, please step up, step back. If you have a question, please ask it. Uh, go ahead and, and share that with us and we'll answer it and then step back and let someone else uh, take over and, and ask their question as well. I should mention too, this meeting is going to be recorded. So we'll have uh, the presentation and questions and answers recorded. We'll share that with, uh, with everyone on our website. We'll put that up on our website. So any of, anyone that you know was interested in this meeting, not able to attend, please let them know that we'll have the presentation up on our website and they can, they can watch it at their leisure and, and contact us if they have questions. I think that's it. With this, I will turn it over to our next presenter, Jessica Lobbs. Great, thank you, Kevin. Um, good evening, I'm Jessica Lobbs. I'm with Kimley Horn and uh, a member of the consultant team supporting Ramsey County on this project. I manage the engineering and environmental aspects. So uh, you're gonna hear a lot from me tonight, um, but we're gonna first just give you a sense of where we're starting from uh, in the, the current work that we are. And as Kevin, um, <clears throat> said there was a pre-project development study completed. And just to put this corridor in context uh, for everyone, so this is a snapshot of the future uh, rapid transit network here in the Twin Cities. And highlight, I think there are a couple of animations here if you wanna just go ahead. Um, many of you are familiar with the Rush Line and Gold Line projects, which are currently in development here on the east side of town. And Riverview uh, is this line in gray. And so you can kind of see here how some, some folks refer to the Riverview Corridor as sort of completing the transit triangle um, with the green line um, there at the top and then the blue line from Minneapolis to uh, down to the airport. Um, Riverview would provide kind of that uh, other side of the triangle here. And so back in, I'm gonna go to the next, next slide. 
um, back in 2018, there was <clears throat> the pre-project development study that was concluded. Um, and that was a multi-year process that really looked at different alignments and different modes for the Riverview Corridor. And the result of that study was um, a locally preferred alternative identified as modern streetcar along uh, West 7th Street uh, from downtown St. Paul to the river, crossing the river through the Fort Snelling area, and then interlining with the Blue Line uh, light rail transit down to the Mall of America. Um, the study left a few areas where more detail or a higher level of analysis was identified as needed, um, but this was the basis for um, and was uh, sort of captured by resolution um, with the Policy Advisory Committee for Riverview as the locally preferred alternative and the mode that would move forward for further study. Um, and this was adopted into Met Council's Transportation Policy Plan um, by amendment in early 2019. Next slide. So when we talk about modern streetcar, we just want to be clear about, about what we mean by that. So um, a this has, modern streetcar has a lot of the benefits of light rail transit, but maybe with a little bit uh, greater flexibility. So you're going to see a lot of similar characteristics to light rail transit um, with areas of shared or exclusive guideway, you know, where the the rail car travels in its own lane. Um, it would have priority at intersections, uh, priority over vehicle traffic. It's a little quieter, smoother, um, has level boarding and a little roomier um, for riders, and really contributes to uh, promoting development and sense of place in a corridor. A uh, modern streetcar would also be electric powered, similar to LRT with the overhead wires like we see on our parts of our system now. There are um, areas in this corridor that we will be taking a look at wireless technology where those wires would not be needed or seen. Um, and this can be a benefit, uh, again, with that flexibility of maybe getting through some more constrained areas or areas where visual, more of a visual intrusion is not um, desired. Uh, and streetcar also gives us the ability to customize the vehicle size for the context of the corridor and for the, the needs of the project. So similar to LRT, but with a little bit more flexibility. Next slide. So that's a really brief synopsis of, you know, many years of work done before, but right now we are in uh, the beginning parts of what we call the engineering and pre-environmental phase. So our, our goal here and our purpose is to refine that locally preferred alternative to apply a little more technical analysis to those alignments and those areas that need a little bit more um, evaluation to really um, show that modern streetcar is viable and can also be competitive. And that's an important part of our work here is that we wanna make sure that we have a transit project uh, in the Riverview Corridor that can compete against other projects in the country and receive federal funding. Next slide. So from all the work that was done before, um, here we are at sort of the beginning of the next phase of getting this project implemented. So we are just in the first year of a three-year engineering and pre-environmental phase, uh, again, with the idea that we really want to get refined the locally preferred alternative and get down to really a maximum of two solid what we call build alternatives or alternatives that we think could move forward and be competitive. And we will be advancing those um, in some areas up to about 25% engineering, and then also starting to look at some of the environmental and social and cultural impacts um, of those alternatives. Um, this is really laying the foundation for the next phase. So you see project development here, um, which is the environmental impact statement or the official environmental documentation phase. 
So we want to do a lot of work in this phase to really set up to have a very efficient environmental document phase. Uh, current federal guidelines dictate that that environmental impact statement or EIS needs to be completed within a two-year time frame. So we really want to be ready um, and have our project well-defined by the time we enter environmental. The environmental will be followed by more detailed engineering, final engineering, and then uh, construction. So we, we still have a ways to go um, in terms of seeing implementation, but right now all these steps lead us to operations um, in the early 2030s, so around 2032, if all goes as planned here. Next slide. So a little bit deeper dive here on the locally preferred alternative and our our charge. What does that mean to refine the locally preferred alternative? So we're focused on streetcar because that is uh, what came out of the previous study. Um, and you see on this, this map here, those gray bubbles and lines. So these are areas where we know we have some outstanding technical issues that need to be resolved. Um, starting kind of on the downtown St. Paul portion, uh, we are looking um, closely at how we connect to Green Line in downtown St. Paul and how we serve Union Depot. Uh, the Seven Corners area, making sure we can, if we can't stay on West 7th, what are, what are some of our other options? Or um, is that still a viable option to be on 7th? Um, same with the West 7th corridor itself. Um, and then the Highway 5 River Crossing is a significant uh, technical issue that we have been avidly working on the past several months. And then kind of there at the bottom, uh, the connection to the Mall of America and how we travel through the South Loop. Through all, all of these, um, we're also, we also need to provide definition to how the streetcar would run on this alignment. Is it in the middle? Uh, is it along the side? And how much of it is dedicated in its own lane or how much of it needs to be shared with vehicle traffic. So as we talk about, these are some of the big issues. There are obviously a lot of other things, um, challenges and opportunities that we're studying within these. But we broke the corridor into four pieces and four teams that we call issue resolution teams. And those are um, Airport Bloomington, starting in the south here, the Bedote Fort Snelling area. Um, Bedote is an area at the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers that is significant um, to our tribal partners. And there are considerations that we are uh, taking into account as we look at the options in that area. And then we have two, <clears throat> excuse me, issue resolution teams in St. Paul, one that focuses on West 7th and one that focuses on downtown. And I'm going to just, as we go through the next slides here, just give a, a glimpse of some of the particular issues in each of those areas. So starting um, down in Bloomington, this is just a, a visual representation of, of some of the things that we are considering within this issue resolution team. So there was an alignment uh, as part of the locally preferred alternative that um, serves the Mall of America, connects to the Mall of America. We are working closely with the city and our and the mall and other partners, Metro Transit, um, to evaluate if that is the best way to serve the mall or if there are possibly other alignments or platform locations. We're also taking a look at the intersections in the South Loop area, traffic operations today, and what those would look like with Riverview added. Uh, and then also working closely with the MAC and uh, Metropolitan Airports Commission and uh, Metro Transit on how we operate through the airport and the tunnel um, that Blue Line currently travels in in that area. Next slide. Moving up then to the Bedote Fort Snelling area. Um, this too had a couple of alignments that were identified in the locally preferred alternative that we are looking at, uh, as well as some other uh, potential options for um, getting between the historic fort and then connecting into Blue Line. 
and then of course how we cross highway five um how uh you know we look at the bridge and the tunnels as they are today uh, and then also how that connects into the other side, the St. Paul side of the river. And I will say this is definitely the area that we have been focusing on the most, uh, especially in the past couple of months, because we know that uh, the decisions that we make here affect other parts of the corridor. Um, there are also some pretty high dollar uh, solutions potentially, and we know that we need to watch our costs, um, again, to make sure this project is competitive. And so we really feel like we need to have a good understanding of our approach to this area before we spend a lot of other time um, in the corridor. So there's a very active uh, issue resolution team around this, this area, and we've been uh, making some, some great headway over the past couple of months with those stakeholders. Next slide. I mentioned two teams in St. Paul, one focused on West 7th. Um, so again, we are focusing on the West 7th alignment itself, but if we find there are significant challenges to staying on West 7th, um, we may take a closer look at the, the CP spur segment that you see there. Um, but in terms of, of what we're looking at here, um, we are considering, again, what how the how streetcar would operate on West 7th, center or side, dedicated or mixed, um, and, and what that roadway cross section looks like. And you heard the, the commissioner mention, you know, beautification or making things look better. Um, as part of the resolution in the previous phase, the city of St. Paul um, and the policy advisory committee were, were clear that they also wanted us to take a close look at how we can improve the streetscape uh, along West 7th. So that is part of this phase of work um, to really think about how we improve the streetscape. And then also it's a priority we know of the city and others to really improve the pedestrian environment um, along West 7th as well. Heading to downtown. Again, taking a look at the alignments that were part of the locally preferred alternative, uh, <clears throat> we are focused on West 7th again in the Seven Corners area, but if we encounter some challenges there, that may um, lead us to also looking at Smith as an option. As we go into downtown on 5th and 6th streets, there are technical issues there with some of the gr steeper grades, um, just figuring out how we interline or um, interact with Green Line and some of the other transit service in downtown, and then how we serve Union Depot. Um, the locally preferred alternative had uh, Riverview coming into the front of the depot, so we are taking a look at what that means technically, um, on how that comes in with Green and, and all the other activity there at the front, and then potentially maybe you know, having to look at how, if we need to go to the back, what that would look like. Uh, so downtown certainly also has um, some of its challenges, but also a lot of opportunities to really integrate with the transit system in downtown St. Paul. Next. So we have all these issue resolution teams, and we better have a roadmap for how we're getting decisions made. And those issue resolution teams are really the foundation. So you see them at the bottom of this chart. Um, that's a lot of the staff and people who are really into the weeds, so to speak, on technical issues. Um, once recommendations come out of those, it goes to the project management team. And then a technical advisory committee, which is made up of technical staff from uh, the cities, counties, um, a lot of resource agencies. And then a community advisory committee has also been formed, which was uh, appointed and has representation both geographically and demographically of the full corridor. And all of those, all of that information and recommendation then filters up to the policy advisory committee, which are your elected officials 
uh, and that committee is chaired by Commissioner Ortega. Off to the side here, we have a stationary planning task force, which is also a citizen-based task force um, that is coordinated closely with the City of St. Paul and then also reports to the Policy Advisory Committee. And our, I mentioned our, the significance of the Bedote area um, and other parts of the corridor, frankly, to our tribal partners. They are part of many of these um, committees but we also have separate meetings with them at their request or when we feel like there are specific issues that need to be discussed in greater depth, we will um, convene the tribes in those discussions. Of course, your input is, is filters through all of this. Um, we, we are always taking public feedback and input through the website and through activities like this meeting tonight. Um, and that gets shared all the way through this, this chart. Next slide. So one of the very first activities um, that we took on uh, in this phase was to revisit the purpose and need that was developed in that previous study. And it's important to refresh the purpose and need for projects like this uh, every once in a while because it really is a foundation for, for decision making. And and that purpose and need was based on, you know, alignments and modes. And now that we have an alignment and we have a mode, um, we, we needed to update that to reflect the goals of this phase of the project. So what is a purpose and need and why is it important? Um, a purpose and need statement really articulates why the project is proposed, why we're doing it, and what it's trying to achieve. Why, why do we need it? Um, it also, you know, all these technical issues we're making uh, or we are trying to resolve and decisions that we're making all relates back to the purpose and need. When we evaluate alternatives against each other, um, we are always basing that in, you know, does this meet purpose and need? What are some of the evaluation criteria that support th those needs? It also is a foundation for the future environmental document a very important part of that environmental impact statement. And we'll also be taking another look at it and refreshing it as needed when that official environmental phase starts. And one important reason for that, um, another important reason for that continuous updating is, you know, we're in sort of a strange time right now coming out of COVID and certainly um, a lot of data still is yet to be seen in terms of behaviors and travel patterns and that sort of thing. So we want to make sure that as the project progresses, we are reflecting the most up-to-date information. So the, I think the next one is the purpose statement. So I'm just going to read, this is the purpose of the Riverview Corridor Project. The purpose of the Riverview Corridor Project is to provide transit service that enhances mobility and accessibility for residents, businesses, and workers, and supports economic opportunities within the project area, particularly in low-income neighborhoods. So really, this statement is, is what we're all about. Um, this is why, why the project is proposed. And to support this statement, then, um, we also need to very clearly articulate what the specific needs are that are driving this, this project. So for Riverview, we have four uh, primary needs that if you've had the chance to look through the documents on the website, you've been able to see some, some of that data to support the needs, but I'm going to go over them just briefly here. So the first is that we need to plan for population and employment growth. So in this corridor, um, between 2020 and 2040, it's expected that population will increase by about 12%, which is almost 16,000 people. Uh, likewise, a 13% increase in employment, which is almost 23,000 more jobs in this corridor. And then just the demand, the trip demand, um, it's projected that by 2040, there will be uh, over 50,000 additional person trips made in this corridor. So there, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of growth happening, and we want to make sure that we're planning for that growth. 
for need statement two, um, this relates to meeting the needs of people who rely on transit. So <clears throat> this is really thinking about who, who needs transit to just um, live their daily lives, who relies on it to get to where they need to be. Um, and, and the metrics we use here are really looking at um, households with no car or, or one car. And you can see here in the corridor, there's about 14% of households that have no car, um, which is above the regional average. There, and about 42% of households have one car, also above average. And then um, a 52% increase within those zero car households, um, the trips to markets within the corridor. So we're seeing a trend of, of activity within the corridor. So those more local trips, people need transit um, to get them to those services. For need statement three, um, this is currently focused on addressing a gap in the metro system and accommodating future travel plans. And really what we're, what we're highlighting here is that even as you know, ridership on other routes across um, the transit system have maybe dropped a bit. The ridership on the metro system, so you know the LRT and BRT lines, has been very consistent and has increased. And particular to this corridor, that's important because um, not just because of its the connections that this corridor provides to regional destinations like. Excel Energy Center, you know, the airport, the Mall of America. Um, but because of all those local trips and the need for local trips. So you can see here too that the Route 54, which is the current bus service along the corridor, 72% of people use that for school, shopping, errands, entertainment, um, and less than 30% are using it as a commute. Um, and across the metro system, that's a little more evenly split um, at 50-50. So there's definitely that um, we have those destinations both at a regional and local level here. For the final need, we just want to make sure that our project is supporting the goals and policies of our local and regional partners. Uh, and here we did focus on the Metropolitan Council's 2040 Transportation Policy Plan and the comprehensive plans for the cities of St. Paul and Bloomington, um, and also reference some county plans. So you see some metrics for equity here, um, but in this need, uh, we investigated goals and policies around transit investments, uh, growth and redevelopment. There are a lot of areas of um, just hot redevelopment and growth uh, in that sense in the corridor. And then certainly equity. Um, communities of color are projected to increase over time in this corridor. Uh, we have 38% people of color, uh, which is a higher percent than the region. Uh, and then 50% of this corridor is identified as area of concentrated poverty. So um, again, wanting to support the goals and policies of our partners uh, in those areas as we think about implementing this project. So with that, um, Kevin mentioned that the purpose and need, both a summary and then the full document is available on the website until this Friday, June 25th. And we would love to hear your comments on that document. Um, those comments will be summarized and provided to various committees, including uh, the next policy advisory committee on, meeting on July 15th. And then I think we have a, a little poll to close out this section before I turn it over to Jay to talk about station area planning. So just based on this presentation, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, uh, the full document, are, do the purpose and needs statements seem to be a good foundation for how decisions should be made as part of this project. Uh, you could say yes, maybe somewhat, or no. Um, 
And I think, Kyla, a box will pop up and you can make your vote. There you go. Um, I just want to kind of get a general sense of, of where people are at. Um, but again, also welcome your more specific comments on the statement. Okay, so it looks like a majority think, um, we do think the topics are covered well, but for those of you who think somewhat or, or no, there's a better way or maybe some things that could be better, we'd love to hear, hear those comments from you. So thank you for that feedback. And I am going to pass it over to Jay Demma to talk about state area planning. Before Jay starts, just as a reminder, the Q&A function is open at any time. So if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to log it in there at the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Okay. Thank you, uh, Alyssa, with that reminder. And Jessica, thank you very much for um, introducing everyone tonight to um, sort of the basics behind um, the streetcar project. Um, my name is Jay Demma and I'm an urban planner. Um, I'm part of the consultant team um, who is managing um, this part of the project uh, that refers to uh, station area uh, planning. And um, I'm gonna provide a brief um, overview um, uh, of that process um, here tonight. So first of all, just to answer the question, uh, what is station area planning? Um, Jessica, uh, just got done talking about how um, you know investments um, like streetcars um, often catalyze uh, development um, in and around the neighborhoods um, close to the station stops. And so, um, as Jessica and her team is looking at a lot of the engineering issues, it's also important to be looking at the neighborhoods around um, each of the station stops um, to see how um, they might uh, evolve and change. And so to just sort of summarize in a brief statement, um, what it might be is that stationary planning is a collaborative process that identifies ways to promote safe and direct station access and transit supported development near transit stations. So, and when we talk about near transit stations, um, we think about, um, again, sort of that, that neighborhood um, level scale of um, our communities. And many times, um, because we're thinking about accessing the stations, we're thinking about folks who are walking to be able to access the transit. And we consider um, about a, a comfortable 10 minute uh, pace for walking uh, for most people is kind of that, that uh, sort of geographic um, range that we might think of. Um, and 10 minutes at a comfortable walking pace is roughly around a half a mile. Um, so we tend to, uh, look at, um, not exactly, it's not um, a real particular science, but we tend to look at an area then that's around a half a mile around each of the station areas. And for this particular um, part of the project, we're looking at um, the stations that are being proposed um, in the city of St. Paul along what would be the sort of the West 7th uh, corridor. Um, um, so we're not necessarily focusing at this point in the project on stations that would be um, uh, uh, in the Hennepin uh, County uh, portion of the corridor. So we're, uh, we're beginning to look at, at these areas um, in St. Paul. Um, when we talk about it being a collaborative process, um, Jessica mentioned previously that there is a task force, a citizen task force that's been formed to guide um, the station area planning process. Um, and this, again, it's uh, geographically and demographically representative of folks who um, live and work and um, um, perhaps own businesses and properties um, in, the, in the corridor. And, um, and they are serving as an advisory body and, uh, and as a task force, um, uh, they're working diligently um, uh, many times on a, a, a will be a monthly meeting basis um, to help sort of develop um, the, the plans themselves. Um, but there will be um, a, a significant amount of um, engaging the broader uh, public and community and helping to create um, stationary plans. Um, uh, next slide, please. So 
So um, the goals of uh, the stationary plans are um, really ultimately to provide a vision for um, each station area um, <clears throat> that, um, you know, as Jessica mentioned previously, you know, economic development and economic opportunities is an important uh, need for the project. So we want a vision for each station area um, that really um, tries to achieve um, and result in an ability for um, those uh, neighborhoods and communities to thrive as a result of the transit investment. Um, so that there's really this, this net uh, positive benefit and, and equity um, for, for all, all people in, in, in each uh, station area. Um, it's also the vision um, is intended to uh, create and develop um, uh, supporting policies um, that help the neighborhoods sort of grow and evolve and thrive as a result of that investment. So those policies um, many times are at the um, city of St. Paul level. And so um, one of the key partners on this project um, are um, uh, the city of St. Paul and, uh, and officials uh, there. Uh, and then sort of the third primary um, goal um, would be for the vision um, for each station area to identify specific implementation steps for each plan. Um, so what that really means is that once um, uh, there's consensus um, in what the vision of the plan should be for each station area, um, that also means we need to call out what specifically are the things um, that need to be done in order to realize the vision and make the vision a reality. Um, so whether that is identifying, let's say, a vacant lot um, and what uh, new use might be on that lot, or that there is a new uh, connection that needs to be created in order to more safely and comfortably get people from the neighborhood to that station area. Um, so we would be identifying those steps as part of that. And, uh, and I wanna also just uh, make mention that when we're looking at these, these stationary plans and the visions associated with them, um, we're looking out over um, a pretty long period of time um, 20 years. Um, now that includes uh, the potential for things that could be happening uh, right away, um, but also things uh, that may take, you know, many years uh, to sort of emerge um, and become a reality. But as long as we have a plan in place, um, we can really help sort of, um, again, sort of um, uh, nurture that and uh, potentially uh, catalyze uh, that change over time. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the process that's involved um, with stationary planning? Um, as you can see with this graph, uh, we've tried to distill it down into a series of steps. Um, it's, um, it's somewhat follow steps, but it's many times iterative. Um, um, but we really do wanna start at a basis where we look at um, recent uh, planning and studying that's occurred um, along the corridor and in the stationary plannings. As many of you who have been longtime residents um, in the West 7th Corridor, you know that there's been a lot of previous work and we wanna build upon that and we wanna be able to recognize that work that's been done and carry forward um, that work that, that's still relevant today and, and, and make sure it gets recognized um, and incorporated into the stationary plans. Uh, we also wanna analyze um, the conditions um, as they are today um, so that we have a really good foundation and solid ground upon which we know where we are today and that we, we know what those conditions are and so that we can identify opportunities uh, for change. Um, and knowing where we are today, then, then we really wanna go out and, and work with our task force and the broader public to create a vision for each station area. And uh, that's gonna require um, a quite a bit of um, uh, uh, just direct involvement with engaging the public through a variety of different means. And then once we have that vision in place, we actually start to develop uh, concepts within each station area that looks at different elements, such as uh, the public realm. Um, how should the streets be? Um, should there be new sidewalks? Should there be new bike facilities? Um, are there new parks or open spaces that could be considered? Uh, we look at the land use. Um, should that change? Should that stay the same? Uh, we look at a uh, movement and circulation. Um, again, thinking about um, how the connections are to um, bus transit um, at the, each, each of the street, streetcar stations, uh, the safety and security around, um, you know, bicycling to and from, walking to and from, um, and so forth. 
And, um, and there's points at which, again, once ideas get created, we bring those out to the public, we get feedback and we refine that. And as I said previously, once there's some level of, con of um, consensus on that, uh, we then begin to think about, hey, what are the next steps? So there's sort of the general process. Um, it's also important to mention that um, we're right now in the very early stages of working with the task force. Um, we've had uh, two meetings so far. We've been uh, working with the task force to kind of understand these, these um, conditions in the corridor. Um, but there's, there's currently, based on the uh, locally preferred alternative, there was identified uh, 10 stations. There may be potentially an 11th station, depending on how this process goes. Um, but that's a lot of different stations to be following this iterative process. So what we're going to be doing is breaking this into stages or phases, where we'll be looking at three to four stations at a time. Um, and later this year, we're going to have a better sense as to which of those stations along um, the St. Paul portion of the corridor we're going to be looking at first, and then eventually getting to systematically. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, so yes, uh, there is this sort of um, sort of phasing process that we're going to look at the look at the entire corridor. Um, so uh, I think that was next slide. So yes, uh, like Jessica had for you just a few moments ago, we have uh, an instant poll question here. Um, uh, this should give you a, a sense of kind of the things that we're going to be um, engaging people um, uh, over the next uh, uh, many months about uh, developing stationary plans. So this question is, is um, what are uh, aspects of uh, the neighborhoods um, along uh, the West 7th and Riverview corridor uh, that are uh, important um, to you and your community? So we have the options of parks and open space, businesses, pedestrian friendly character, availability of transit, housing options, or perhaps there's just something else out there that's not covered in this short list. Great, on to you, Christina. Thank you. As Jay mentioned, next we're gonna talk about the consideration of history and culture related to the Riverview Streetcar Project. My name is Christina Slattery and I'm our architectural historian with Mead and Hunt. Mead and Hunt, along with our archeological partner, Two Pines, is on the project team to aid in project activities related to the identification and consideration of historic properties. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about why we consider historic properties and what historic properties are. Can we get the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, federal and state laws require consideration of a project's effects on historic properties. Under the law, a historic property is defined as a building, structure, object, site, or district that is eligible for or listed in the National Register of Historic Places. If we could go back one slide, please. Um, these laws um, related to historic properties were created from public concern over governmental actions that affect places that matter to a community, region, or a state. Can we go back one slide, please? Thank you. Um, places matter to people. So these laws help agencies balance necessary infrastructure improvements with the value and importance of our shared history. Historic properties include the built environment or above ground resources, and also resources located below ground or archeological resources. As part of this project, Meet and Hunt is compiling information on known above ground resources that have already been identified. These include things such as the Schmidt Brewery or Fort Snelling. But our work will also determine if there are potential above ground historic properties in the project area that have yet to be identified. This includes uh, buildings, bridges, statues, roadways, parks, et cetera. You can go forward again, thanks. Um, as part of this work to identify the built environment, um, we're not doing a full analysis to make a final determination of eligibility um, in this phase of the project, but that will come in a future phase of the project. Uh, next, Michelle will address the items on the additional, additional historic properties on this slide that we are studying. Hello everyone, I'm Michelle Terrell uh, with Two Pines Resource Group. And uh, as Christina said, I will introduce two additional cultural resources studies being undertaken for the Review Corridor project. The first of these is investigation of archeological resources along the project corridor. In Minnesota, archeology span covers approximately 10,000 years of human history. And sites can vary in scale from small artifact scatters indicating to us where Native American campsites were in the past, 
to the extensive ruins and foundations of large industrial complexes. During this study, known archaeological resources in the area will be reviewed and the corridor will also be surveyed for new sites. The second investigation I wanted to highlight is a cultural landscape study. The goal of this study is to work with Dakota communities to identify the key features and elements of the Bedote or confluence area. These traditional cultural resources are not captured through architectural history or archaeological studies and Coldwater Spring is a good example of a type of property that would be included in this study. Next slide please. In recognition of the importance of the area to tribal communities, Ramsey County has also been working with tribal partners to get, gather feedback on the project as a whole. This includes ongoing tribal consultation, as well as participation of tribal representatives in the issue resolution teams. Next slide. So public input is a key component in identifying historic properties. So we have a poll question to get started on that topic. What aspects of the area's history are important to you and your community? Is it the stories of people who live here? Is it historic events that occurred here? Is it older buildings and structures located in the area? Or is it something else? As you complete the poll, I just wanna let the public know that this is the first of many public meetings. So there'll be time over the next several years for, for you to come forward with information on what places matter to you and be part of the dialogue about historic properties in the project area. Okay, it looks like almost 50% said the stories of people who lived here um, with historic events and other buildings um, in the area as additional items. So great, thank you. If you have additional comments or questions about historic properties, please add them into the Q&A. And next we'll go to Lissa. Thanks, Christina. Hi, I'm Lissa Washington. I am managing the communications and community engagement portion. Um, and uh, along with my team, happy to have all of you here. Um, I just wanna run over a few things that we're trying to do um, over the course of this entire project, the three years that we're all here. Um, and so I, first I would say that we are looking to, um, we have three goals and we're looking to um, have an informed and engaged public that reflects the diversity of the corridor. So we wanna make sure that we are capturing voices um, throughout and across the community. Um, goal two, meaningful input to guide the project. Again, uh, we, are, we are happy to take any and all input that you have, um, and we are um, excited to continue the conversation, the dialogue, um, and also public accountability and transparency. So um, having meetings like this, and hopefully, um, when, it's, when we're all ready to, we, we can meet in public and meet out, out in person and uh, have presentations face-to-face -face and have uh, different pop-ups and different things like that. So those are our three goals. Um, we wanna make sure that we are bringing everyone along, as many people as we can, bring along the whole process, much to uh, what uh, my other colleagues have mentioned about station area, cultural resources, and of course, the engineering portion of this project. Um, so in the way in which we plan on doing that um, is uh, we have a commitment um, to our engagement approach, and that is to reach the underrepresented. And so we are um, trying to reach as much of the River, Riverview corridor community as possible. So we seek to engage um, those who are underrepresented at larger stakeholder meetings, um, sometimes maybe not quite on this platform um, or have the opportunity to go to open house um, open house meetings such as this. Uh, so our goal is to do, this, uh, to do this by going where people are. So we wanna join events, we wanna uh, go to other kinds of meetings, um, but we also wanna create opportunities. So uh, you might find us in front of a grocery store or, or some or a library or, some, or a school or some other event, um, uh, creating some kind of small event or a shopping center. Um, so we also wanna support the impacted. So we wanna to listen to the residential, the tribal and business community along with the broader community um, as this project is going on to have, because it has an impact on the entire community and the corridor um, and then coordinating the connected. So a lot of you here are very well connected and have been following this project. And uh, thank you for doing that and continuing to stay with us. Um, but we wanna bring 
you along as well and bring our project partners and our project stakeholders along as well um, so that there's a true interface and true understanding um, of why and where and how, how decisions are being made. Um, so from there, I think I want to go into a little bit of our kind of our timeline um, or how we're planning on and providing engagement. So um, we plan on doing this in a multi-strategy way. So uh, we want to and are excited to get back in person um, through agency and advisory committee meetings. So you saw that we were meeting with um, the whole broad spectrum of people. Um, we want to have quarter conversations. So we want to get involved in groups um, at the neighborhood level. Um, you know, we can get down to the street level um, and, and really engage everybody and, and get to all the communities. So business and institution outreach. Um, we know there are a lot of, a lot of businesses um, that have concerns. And of course, we want to address those and, and be able to um, have a way in which to engage. Um, so community meetings, we're, we're looking to do small groups, large groups. We're looking to gather young and old and everything in between. So um, we are also looking to have pop-up engagements. So like I said, we're going to, you know, show up at the shopping center. We're going to show up um, kind of kind of where, where people are and, and where people are naturally. And uh, we are planning on implementing a community liaison team, which will be kind of an artist-led um, endeavor. So there'll, there'll be uh, creative ways to um, provide input and feedback based on what's going on. Um, we are hoping um, over this three years to get a healthy number of bus, bike, and walking tours. Um, if we can find ways to do that safely. Um, and and, and we're, we're strategizing right now about ways that maybe aren't uh, necessarily a gathering of groups, but perhaps uh, setting up course in a virtual tour of sorts um, that you can follow along at your own pace and at your own time. Um, again, we talked about site-specific meetings and we've talked about Native American outreach. So we wanna reach not only our tribal partners at, um, that are on a formal basis, but uh, reach the larger Native American community as well. So um, as far as online tools, um, we have the project website. I think a lot of you are familiar with that. Um, we send out e-newsletters and uh, many of you are signed up for that. Um, also, we have social media and online media placement. So we're, we're, we're getting out there and you'll see on the next slide, you'll see that we have um, ways in which we're doing that uh, or our, all of our handles. So, um, you know, subscribe to our email news updates at riverviewcorridor.com. Um, join us live on, join us on late Facebook, um, like some of our posts. We, we uh, have a great team putting together uh, information to um, create create a platform in a way to engage with you um, with small bite-sized information. So it's not, it's a lot to take in. Um, and also follow us on Twitter. So I think with that, we do have one last poll question. And that is, what is the best way to connect with people in this area? Um, so A, project website and email list through social media, online public meetings, in person at public meetings, um, to present at community events, meetings, things like that, or are there other ways that you can think of? Um, so I'll give you a moment to answer that. And also, as we're, we are uh, gathering that up, I'm going to um, queue up as we're getting to the very end of our formal presentation. Um, I'm going to queue up our team here to turn their cameras on and give a quick introduction um, of themselves and uh, how they're tied to the project. All right, so there we are. Pre presenting at community events and meetings, of, of course, we're, we're happy to do that. Um, we are compiling where we should go. Uh, if you have any suggestions, please feel free to send us an email at info at uh, riverviewcorridor.com. We, um, I, I am one of the people that receives that email along with Kevin, who you've spoken to at the very beginning, um, Hyla also, and uh, couple of our other team members as well. Um, so with that, um, I am, have introduced myself. I think you've spoken to Jay um, and you've heard from Christina and Michelle. So I'm gonna, my next person that I see is Hyla. Um, so if Hyla would like to uh, unmute and un turn her camera on and introduce herself. I'm Hyla Mays. I'm working with Alyssa on the engagement team. Okay, I'm going to put Jennifer on the spot. That's the next person I see. Hi, I'm Jennifer Jordan. I work for Ramsey County 
on this project and I'm focusing on the engineering and community environmental work as well as cultural resources. Next I see Frank. Good evening everyone. My name is Frank Alarcon. I'm a planner with Ramsey County Public Works and I'm managing the station area planning work uh, working closely with Jay Demma who presented earlier. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. And you've met Jessica. Jessica can certainly wave. There she goes. She probably needs a drink of water for all of that presenting. I almost stopped you in the middle of it. Thank you for doing that. Um, at Kevin, you saw him at the very beginning, so I'll let him reintroduce himself. All right, thank you. Yes, I'm Kevin Roggenbuck with Ramsey County Public Works, and I'm working a lot with Lissa and Highland Public Engagement. I'm involved in other aspects of the project as well. All right, Laura, you're on. My name is Laura Micklick, and I'm with Boltman Mank and I work with Hyla as a communicate or a project communication specialist. Okay, and I guess I see Mike and Mike Rogers available up there and I see Ken Ayeso and I think they were both introduced at the very beginning. So I will let everyone turn their cameras back off. Um, it sounds like we are at questions and um, Hyla and Laura have really been doing a good job putting that uh, tracking and monitoring that. So I will let them take over um, as far as uh, reading questions aloud. And then from there, um, the team will answer. Certainly, thanks. I'll, I'll be reading the questions in the Q&A. And as I'm reading the questions, please feel free to go ahead and add more. Um, we, have, we have a good list here, but I think there's, we have allocated quite a lot of time today. We wanna make sure it's very useful to you. So if you don't hear your question answered, please add it yourself. Um, my first question on here was just asking, say, whether to be notified if there's no comment or vote. I'm assuming that means with regards to the polling or the voting within this in this context. Um, I would say that the tracking, for those of you who voted, we didn't really, or polled early, we really didn't mention that. Of course, it was an optional thing. We have total tallies, so we know that not everyone voted, which is perfectly fine. It was an, a voluntary piece, but that is part of this. We're not tying that to any individual person. It's just a collection, sort of a, a feeling, the sense of the room especially since we can't see all your faces. Was there any other follow-up on that question? Great. Um, next question, Joe Scala um, said, I hope the rest of the team will introduce themselves tonight during the open house. I think the audience would like to see the other folks who've helped make this meeting possible. Um, and it sounds like we just had those, those um, everyone introduced themselves at this point, right? We're good. Great. All right, um, next question. Um, this, is a, this is a comment from someone named Jessica, asking to Jessica, I think. Um, Jessica, I voted for the planning, I voted no for planning, primarily due to the lack of consideration given the historic properties at the river and through the Highway 5 extension. Fort Snelling is vital, and although there has been extensive work in the area of transportation, the original structure from the early times are still intact. Last month, the 1853 barns were uncovered during construction east of Building 17 and along the DOT right of way to the west. The current project does not collaborate with Ramsey County or Met Council. How has the state been involved in consultation in the area of the state-owned historical society has no ownership of the area? This has been a difficult situation as more recent construction was led to believe the owner of the property and construction site is part of the Minnesota Historical Society. There's a state official being contacted and involved in the process. Is there a state official being contacted and involved in the process that is not part of Minnesota Historical Society? There's a lot there, Jessica, so let me know if you need me to read any of that back. But I No, think we... I, I saw it earlier too, so I am prepared um, to speak to that. Um, so for one, just, um, and I appreciate your comment about, you know, the consideration to the historic properties of the river um, and through the Highway 5 extension. I would encourage you, if you haven't looked at the full purpose and need statement at the end of that, which we didn't summarize in here, but there are a full list of goals and objectives that um, correlate to those needs. And that is where we certainly have goals um, and objectives for the project that are directly related to um, historic properties. And other, uh, I saw another comment too about environmental impacts at the river. Um, those are certainly covered there. And then just a reminder that the purpose and need is one piece of the puzzle. It's kind of the framework, uh, but as we get into environmental analysis of these alternatives, um, those aspects will be evaluated fully. And hopefully you got a sense of that from Christina and 
on the shelves part of the presentation too. Um, regarding resources at Fort Snelling, Michelle is very involved in that um, and is aware of that work you, you spoke of, the barns being uncovered um, in the area last month. Uh, as far as state agencies, so I can tell you that on our the Dote Fort Snelling issue resolution team, uh, we have a number of agencies represented there, including a number of state agencies. So um, in addition to the Minnesota Historical Society, we have uh, the DOT, the Department of Transportation, the State Historic Preservation Office, the Department of Natural Resources, um, as well as the four recognized Dakota tribes, um, the National Park Service, which also has jurisdiction there, um, as well as the uh, Minneapolis Parks, St. Paul counties. So um, if there's a state agency that you think is not represented there that we should be talking to, please let me know. Um, I know Kevin and Jennifer have also spoken with the Fort Snelling Area Joint, Joint Powers uh, Group, which represents a lot of different property owners there, and we are continuing to engage with them at their request. Um, so we're, we're very aware of the complexity of the property ownership in that area and certainly are keeping tabs on the, um, the historic and archaeology piece there. Great, thanks. All right, next question. I think this might, this also is probably for you, Jessica. And this was, and he noted that this was submitted earlier via email. Um, so for those of you who, I think we mentioned earlier, info at riverviewcorridor.com, certainly you can submit any questions th through that as well. Why isn't an alternative to West 7th Street being evaluated for the modern streetcar when so many along West 7th prefer other options than the locally preferred option? For example, there are so many benefits to an alignment that align enhances the natural wonders of the river and St. Paul's Park system, such as a pedestrian crossing to Harriet Island, Irvine Park, North High Bridge Park Elevator, Victoria Park, Crosby Lake, Highland Park, Hidden Falls, Gateway Park, even to Minnehaha Park. This route harkens back to the 19th century bluff top concept of the Grand Round along the river corridor, the loop envisioned by Horace Cleveland who designed Como Park. A river route historically also references St. Paul's early adoption of the rail system. Yeah, and I actually, um, I would maybe tee up Mike Rogers on this too for the previous study um, to kind of talk about that process of how we arrived at the LPA. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I'm here. I, I just I had a epic fail with my wife and did not coordinate schedules well enough. So I had to do a quick <laughs> shut everything down, run to get the kid from his appointment and now I'm back. So um, can you go through the question one more time? I, I got some of it, but not all of it. I can just certainly sort of, I can repeat it. You want to oh. just kind of summarize mm -hmm. it, Hila? Sure. It was asking why um, an alternative to West 7th Street being evaluated for modern streetcar, um, noting that many on West 7th Street prefer other options. And they're talking about the the advantage the advantages of being along the river for its scenic beauty and connections to history and to parks and so forth. All so right, here we go. How does that work? Let's get there my video. <laughs> oh, this is weird. Um, so, <laughs> all right. Uh, the reason that it, it wasn't considered is that it actually kind of was considered in the 2014 to 2017 pre-project development study. We looked at 60 different alignment options that went. Um, in all manners along the, the corridor. So they primarily focus on things like Shepherd Road, West 7th Street, the CP Spur, um, things like uh, where do you go in downtown St. Paul, uh, where do you get across the river, and then ultimately how do you connect through the airport to uh, the mall itself. So when we looked at things like Shepherd Road that would have gotten more of that river route, it had a benefit of being fast and it had an incredible negative of not being really near anybody. Um, so what you ended up doing is not really serving anybody uh, other than basically an end-to-end -end trip and knowing what this corridor needed to be based on its purpose and need, it needed to serve more people. They needed to go where people wanted to go, whether it was uh, jobs, education, recreation, shopping, and those uh, destinations really just aren't along the river. So while it would be nice to have something along the river, if all you're interested in is connecting downtown to the airport or the mall, it doesn't really serve the, what this corridor needed to serve, which was everybody along the entire way. So I think that, that covers it. 
Thanks. Yep. Will it be more or less? I, I go ahead. Next question. Unless was, was anyone else going to chime in on that one? Good. Great. Um, next question will be: Was will there be more or less stops on the route than currently used by the Route 54 bus? Will the 54 bus be discontinued? I think that's probably Jessica again. I saw Jennifer pop her camera up. I'd be I happy think, to take this yeah, one. Go, go ahead. Okay. Sure. So um, the 54 bus does run along this corridor currently, and you know it's it's too soon in the process to be able to figure out um, what Metro Transit will do with the 54 bus as we develop this project. But what typically happens with transit projects is we work very closely with Metro Transit to make sure that the bus system feeds into any new investments that we, we might have. Um, and so, you know, looking at, at the current ridership of the 54 and how that plays into um, those riders who might shift to a streetcar, um, is something that that we're undertaking as part of this phase. So that decision hasn't been made. Um, it's too soon, but when the time is right, um, we'll be figuring out how to best feed this particular transportation investment. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. Um, let's see. I think the next question is probably more of Christina's team. What about the history of the European immigrant communities, specifically German, Czech, Slovak, Italian, as cultural resources for West Seventh. So what about the history of the European immigrants as history? So we certainly understand that there's a rich history of immigrant communities in this corridor. And I know some buildings and properties that have that are associated with them have already been identified. Um, and we'll certainly consider those, but as part of our survey and study, We'll be looking for additional properties that have those associations. So any input that the public has would be very welcome about um, buildings and structures related to those communities and their history. Thanks. Um, the next the next comment was just that the poll question sh should have an all of the above options as it seems too early to force a single answer. I can respond to say I, I think we were trying to get people to have to choose, but but we can certainly take that under advisement for future polls to make sure that people have an option to pick all the ones that they think apply. Unless there's other comments on that. All right. And the next comment, uh, next question was for, again for Michelle. Your Michelle, your previous Dakota dedicated work gives you access to recent materials and reports dating back to Two Rivers CDC and other nonprofits, including the Minnesota Historical Society's attempt to document Dakota importance. As you stated, Dakota is your focus. What is being done to represent the indigenous and European cultures who were violently displaced by the Dakota tribes? As you're aware, the Dakota did not occupy this area called the Contemporary Dakota Society of Esmodote until after their triumph over the Lowe tribe at Pilot Knob in the 1760s, and additional attacks against the Ojibwe reaching to the 1830s as documented by Lawrence Taliaferro and several missionaries in place during the 1820s and forward. Thank you for addressing how indigenous and European tribes people are being represented in your research obligations and under cultural landscape reports. Yeah, I appreciate uh, the comment and I noted the commenters uh, later correction. Um, certainly those communities and that history uh, will be captured and included in the project's uh, larger cultural context. Also, I would like to note um, Ramsey County has expanded the tribal consultation to include uh, the displaced and exiled uh, communities, which include the Iowa. And of course, uh, the Ojibwe are also being uh, consulted. But I'll certainly keep this uh, comment in mind as we move forward with our work. Thank you. And, and to your point, the, the typo, it says later on, it says the pilot knob date should read 1670s, not 1760s. Okay. Um, next comment, maybe this is for Lissa, um, would really like a virtual tour during construction, having virtual tour updates. Or maybe someone else in the project, because I don't think we're talking about construction phase right now. Yeah, I, I can jump in and respond to that. Uh, 
during the pre-project development phase we did a few years ago, we had walking tours of several parts of the project when we wanted to show people how the how the route might fit within the Canadian Pacific Rail Spur or how it might work on West 7th Street in different locations. Uh, during construction, having a virtual tour updates, that's something that's many years in the future and we can we can consider that when we when we get to that phase, but uh, at least in this phase of work, we do plan on having more uh, walking tours of the area to to get people's feedback on on uh, the location of the potential location of the project near culturally significant areas, uh, near residential areas, and, and bridge structures and other things like that. Great, thanks. All right, um, next comment, next question. What is the schedule for completing the issue resolution phase? Someone want to take that? I can take that. <clears throat> um, so I mentioned there's a that we're in sort of a three year environment uh, engineering and pre environmental phase. We have one wave of issue resolution teams here where we're really focused on uh, by the beginning of next year, trying to narrow down to those two build alternatives that I talked about. But then the issue resolution will continue um, as we refine some of those technical issues. So, I mean, we're we're partway through year one of a three year process. I don't know, Jennifer, if you have anything else to add to that. Yeah, I mean, just as um, processes to select alignments and then modes, and it's it's a further process of refinement as you get into the technical issues and and figure out what works and what doesn't, and then you know how much it costs. So it's a continual issue refinement process, even, even after this phase. So um, until we get it to construction. Great. Thanks. All right, um, next questions. Have there been any significant decisions yet as to vehicle or alignment? I can, I can go Jennifer? ahead and jump in. Um, so in terms of, of alignment, we have a general alignment that connects downtown St. Paul at the existing central station um, running along 5th and 6th and then running on West 7th to the river, across the river, through Fort Snelling to the Mall of America um, and the airport. So we have a general alignment that, that we're working on to figure out um, if it works. Um, in terms of a vehicle, uh, the vehicle type is a modern streetcar, which as Jessica said in her um, presentation, has a lot of flexibility because it, it, it runs on rails in the street like an LRT car, but it can run in mixed traffic. Um, so right now during this phase, um, this is what uh, the rough, alignment is and what the vehicle type is. Great. All right, um, next one seems to relate to stations, or stationary planning, I, I think. Worried about keep, about upkeep of trash collection and cleaning. I ride, ride both the blue and green for shopping and take the 54 to, to, the 54 to work. Many of the stations are well kept, others not so well. Would like to make sure any added landscaping is kept up and the stations are well maintained. No broken glass, roofs with sun protection, winter heaters, and finally open enough that one feels safe. No chance of being pressed into a corner when traveling late at night. Just want to make sure there is proper budget to keep stations as a positive addition to any neighborhood. We'll take that one, Hila. Okay, uh, great. Yeah, I, I think that point in the question is very well taken. Um, as far as making sure there's enough budget, um, you know, as as we go through this process and scope out the project and make decisions, um, we we pay very close attention to the project's budget, not just the project's capital budget or or the the budget needed to construct the project, but also the project's operating budget, um, which is which is the ongoing yearly um, budget needed to operate and maintain the line, and so part of that operations and maintenance budget. Is exactly what the what the question refers to. It's things like trash collection, cleaning stations, making sure they're comfortable places to wait um, to catch the streetcar. Um, also things like you know replace, replacing anything that gets damaged. Um, and um, you know the, the question ref references broken glass. You know responding to those types of situations if they arise. Um, so 
we definitely work very closely with Metro Transit to make sure that there is adequate budget um, so that you know the, the project looks um, it is well maintained over the long term. It doesn't just look good, you know, the first the first year or two it's operating, um, but rather, you know, it's since it's going to be a long term uh, um, resource for the community that it looks it, it looks and, and operates well uh, over the long run. So, good 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 point um, in that question. Thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, um, next question. This is about the nature of streetcar. Considering that the streetcar in quotes, has to be able to use light rail track and stations and considering it could run entirely on its own right of way, what aspects of the streetcar are still a streetcar? Kyla, I can go ahead and take take that one. Yep. So, um, okay. Is the streetcar in the sense that it can operate in mixed traffic, um, whereas a light rail vehicle is, is typically just in its own right of way. A streetcar can operate in dedicated right of way or it can operate in mixed traffic. We are still in the phase right now where we're figuring out um, what segments where it might run on its own or where it might be running with traffic. So there's just still questions um, that we look to get answered as we delve into the technical details, but that is the chief distinction. It is a streetcar and that it can run with mixed traffic or it can run on its own. Great. All right, um, the next is more of a statement, but someone may want to respond to it. The purpose statement ignores any impact on the river and its environment. Yeah, and I, I referenced this one before too on the historic uh, comment that I would encourage you to look at the goals and objectives as part of that full project purpose and need statement that you'll see some of those river elements reflected there. Okay, great. All right, um, the next one's directed at Jessica. Jessica, thank you for the response. You'll be proactive to develop a state contact who's familiar with Fort Snelling and the area as a state property with all resources, including buildings being state assets. In the slides, it appears the proposed target station is in the area between Coldwater and the historic fort in the site of the existing horse stable being used as storage by the management company, Minnesota Historical Society. You're all doing a great job tonight. I appreciate the transparency and dedication to collaborate with the public. Thank you. Just and as I yeah. was a follow up to your comments, you have more to add to that or? No, just thanks for the comments and the information and we'll make sure that um, we're well covered in terms of those assets and resources in the area. Okay. All right, uh, next question. What phase does rider safety get analyzed? I can start that. I don't know if anyone else will have anything to add, but um, I know that as part of the environmental impact statement, there is a safety and security uh, section of that document. So there will be an evaluation there. I'll add to Jessica's comment that when thinking about uh, uh, getting to and from um, the stations themselves, the stationary planning process uh, will be looking at um, you know, very, very closely, um, you know, concerns around, um, you know, the, the physical safety and security um, on those access points, um, you know, because, uh, you know, the stations themselves, it's important for those to be safe and secure, but the routes in which we take to be able to get to the stations, that's also going to be an important consideration as well. Okay. All right, um, next question. Why not implement a two-way connection Y where Riverview meets the blue line? That would allow for trains to alternate heading southwest to MSP and MOA or northwest via blue line to downtown Minneapolis and other LRT connections and destinations, adding considerable mobility and accessibility to the Riverview experience. That's it, Jessica. I can just, or Jennifer. Or Jennifer, I mean, I, 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 I go can ahead. go ahead and, and take this. So. Um, as we are working through the Fort Snelling area, we are figuring out how we can actually do just that, how we can interline with the existing blue line and be able to connect Riverview 
at the existing Fort Snelling station so folks can have that option to go north to downtown Minneapolis on the blue line or continue on river view to the airport and the Mall of America. So that is part of the work that we are doing uh, as part of this phase. Can pull the map because I think we have a number of questions that are sort of geographically referenced. So people want to be looking at, it might not hurt to have it on the screen. Okay, there we go. Great. All right, um, next question. Um, it, w7, which I think is west 7th, is still 80 feet wide. Significant concerns about allowing for right of way for emergency vehicles exist via state law. The current alignment proposal on W7, West 7th, with fixed rails either center running or side running has huge implications for the existing property owners on the street. What's the status of your information gathering process in this regard? Jennifer, just a question. I, I guess, uh, is Hylas team or someone can speak to the communications aspect or Kevin maybe, but um, we do have okay. yeah. a group convened to of stakeholders to speak about issues along West 7th. But in terms mm -hmm. of other information gathering from businesses and property owners, Kevin? Mm -hmm. Yes, we've, uh, we've met with the West 7th Business Association and previously we'd met with Highland District Council or uh, rather Highland Business Association as well. We've spoken with the Capital Rivers part, uh, Public Realm Committee as well. So uh, we've been talking with business community about the project and, and getting their feedback on it. I think this question might refer to emergency, it's, it does refer to emergency vehicles. Uh, what we did in the first phase of the work is we met with the, uh, we met with the, the fire chief, I believe on West 7th Street by Randolph, we discussed the project with them. They were concerned that uh, their vehicles wouldn't be able to turn around in the street or access both sides of the street should there be a fire on West 7th. Uh, we talked with, with him and explained how a modern streetcar and embedded tracks and shared use can work. We'd simply stop the streetcar, allow the uh, the uh, emergency vehicles to cross over the tracks and access whatever they needed to for their emergency purposes. Same goes for ambulances as well. Uh, but we are aware of, of what needs to be done, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of allowing uh, for that right, the right amount of turning distance and access for emergency vehicles. All right, um, next question. How set in place are the potential station locations? Could an addition can additional station or two be added depending on how the exact route aligns after more study? I can go ahead and take that. So right now we have basically a line on a map with, um, with little dots indicating the stations. And so figuring out exactly where those stations should go um, will be uh, a key interplay between the stationary planning process as well as the technical process. So figuring out um, how stations can work um, specifically out boots on the ground. Um, in terms of um, adding additional stations, you know, something that we have to be mindful as we try to develop a project that will get funded through a federal process is, is cost and ridership and how those, those things interplay. So um, we have to be mindful of the more stations you add, probably the more expensive the construction cost and you know that can affect how competitive you are. But at this point, um, we're still um, in early stages to try to define where stations should go and um, and interplay that information with stationary planning and the technical engineering. Gail, anything else to that? All right. Um, next question, funding is federal funding from, I would say is funding federal funding from taxes and county resident taxes paid? Not sure what that's asking. Maybe just the sources of funding for this. I can go ahead and at least start um, the answer to this question. So the bulk of, of the project funding for a project like this, um, we would be looking at at the federal government to at least try to um, provide at least 50% of the funding. Um, and so that's a really key part of um, the technical analysis, making sure that it's cost competitive from, from a federal transit agency standpoint. 
Um, in terms of, of other funding sources, local funding sources, I would defer to, to Mike Rogers to maybe speak to that in terms of, of when we would get to that point, because we're nowhere close to um, that point in the process. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. The, the assumed local funding for this project would come from the Ramsey County Regional Railroad Authority property tax and then from the transit sales tax that is a quarter, or I'm sorry, a half cent sales tax that the county implements um, within the county borders. So those would be the two funding sources that would pay for roughly 50% of the corridor. And as Jennifer mentioned, we're looking for about 50% of the project to be paid for with federal funds. Okay, thanks. All right, um, the next question. As a person without a car, the virtual tour would be really helpful could also use it to share with others that are bound to transit for shopping, work, and leisure. Kevin, did you wanna to respond to that one? Sure, I can respond to that. Uh, I remember when, I believe it was the Green Line Extension or Blue Line Extension, I forget which one, when that was being developed, uh, they created a kind of a virtual tour, almost like a, a drone flying overhead of where the route would go and where the stations would be. I think when we get farther down the line, when we uh, finalize uh, our locally preferred alternative, when we resolve a lot of these issue areas that we're working on now, uh, and, and things are set, and when our station areas are, are fairly well set and established, we can look at doing something like that to share that information with the public so, so they can sort of uh, virtually ride the streetcar on its route all the way from, from downtown St. Paul to the, to the airport and the mall. We'll look, at, we'll, look at, we'll look at doing that. I was say, just to tag on to that, we are, we are looking uh, with our, our artist liaison team to find ways to document the corridor in a way that's um, for a user experience. So um, we, through photography, um, maybe short videos, things like that, maybe we can talk about um, different ways in mm -hmm. which to, to break this corridor down because it's frankly, it's, it's, it's big and small at the exact same time. Um, and so um, helping to understand all those different pieces um, as uh, uh, Jessica's team has broken it down into kind of four areas, but maybe really taking a deeper dive and maybe we can find ways to do that um, and, and launch it on a platform for, for people to see. Okay, um, this is actually currently the last question in the queue. I don't know if, if anyone has another one, you may wanna consider typing it now. I mean, we, we I think we have this meeting scheduled till eight, but we're really here to through as many questions as there are. Um, I'll just go ahead and read this one then. Um, given the relatively undeveloped corridor, mostly due to the freeway of Shepherd Road along the river, and given all the resources that do exist along Shepherd Road, doesn't this alignment beg for consideration from future residential development, as well as close proximity to businesses and re residents along West 7th, given the 10 minute walk? I'll take this one, Hyla. Um, so Shepherd Road one, was one of the potential alignments considered in the pre-project development study that was that was referenced earlier. That was the study um, that Ramsey County led that concluded um, a few years ago and that determined the locally preferred alternative, which is what we're, we're looking at on this slide. Um, one of the reasons that Shepherd Road uh, wasn't carried forward uh, as the locally preferred alternative was is that it is fairly separated from um, the many destinations along West 7th Street and transit is most useful to people when it goes um, to the places where, where people tend to go the most, which is um, businesses um, and, and, and other busy places which uh, West 7th Street has and Shepherd Road doesn't have a lot of. Um, so for that reason, uh, as part of this phase of work, we're, we're not looking at, at Shepherd Road as, as a potential alignment. We're really focused on um, West 7th Street uh, with the potential um, for part of the CP spur. Along the, along the corridor. And I would just add to that too, that in, in our previous work, the alignment along, along Shepherd Road was problematic, not, in, not only in that it was too far away from the development on West 7th Street to attract ridership, but it's also kind of nestled along the bluff and there's no opportunity for development or redevelopment along that area, no opportunity for a station that's accessible to anyone who'd be living close or, or having a destination close to that, to that area too. Um, Wait, I, there's been a, three more questions that have appeared in the past couple minutes. So go ahead. Sorry. No, that's okay, Hila. I just wanted to catch this one. Okay, and see that, yeah, I wanted to see, not to the question, but I, I do see that um, a couple of other questions are populating in the question and answer, but one did sneak into the chat. 
And um, I wanted to get that out there. It says, Jessica noted during her presentation that due to COVID, much of the data she presented may have to be revisited, i.e. potential ridership increasing by 51,000. How will this impact federal funding and how will the data be validated? I can, I can jump in just on one clarification. So that 51,000, I think that's in reference to the trip demand 2010 to 2040 number that was on the screen, which was 53,100 additional person trips. So there's a distinction there between ridership. I just don't want that to be the ridership number that's out there. But um, I don't know if either someone from the county or I know Aaron Mitchell from Metro Transit is is on the line too. Um, if Aaron, you could just talk a little bit about how Metro Transit is handling data post COVID. I think we need to make her a presenter, so we'll give her a second. Give she, Hila. She is now a presenter. Okay. I don't know if she has access to it quite yet, but Aaron has. Aaron, you should be able to unmute and speak at, at will. All right, I am here now. Thank you. All right, um, could you repeat exactly what the question was? I heard it was about the the 51,000 riders pre-COVID and could you actually cite who it was that made that comment? Yeah, I don't know if you heard me, Erin. I think that was in reference to on one of the purpose and needs slides, there was a, a number of 53,100 additional person trips. So trip demand between 2010 and 2040 projected. So not ridership per se, but person trips, but I think just in terms of um, the question is how, if we have to update data, you know, post COVID, um, how does that impact federal funding or how do you validate the data? I wondered if you could just kind of talk about Metro Transit's approach to this post COVID time. Absolutely. Um, right now, um, we are uh, certainly using data that we have um, prior to COVID. Um, in a lot of our, our data analyses for projects across the metro area. Um, but as we get into the next phases of, of an EIS and different phases, at that point, that's when we're gonna have to start looking at what uh, new data updates might be, adjusting the model and being able to kind of adjust for those changes in, in ridership, whatever that they might be. I think Hila is advancing to the slide in which uh, that yes. number was referenced. Yeah. yeah, that was, I think that was the, that was the, the reference. Okay. Can you answer that then? Great. Um, let's see. Oh, is there any other comments on that? And thanks again, Erin, for chiming in. Um, if I can, there's a couple more questions here than in the chat. I mean, in the, sorry, in the Q&A. Um, is there, is that half cent by Ramsey County in existence now, or would that be a new amount levied? on the county side. Yeah, I can jump in on that one. That half cent is currently levied. So it's been levied for a couple of years. And prior to that, it was a quarter cent that was levied since around 2008. Okay, great. All right, um, let's see, just one more question at this point. So, oh, two, two more questions. <laughs> one just one popped up. Some cities make this type of transit free to riders. Is that the intent for this project? And if riders will be charged a free fee, will it be a more secure paid area for paid passengers than the current green line or blue line open designs? I, well, I can go ahead and take this. So this would be a transit experience, much like a bus or a train in the sense that you would be paying a fare. So it would not be free. Um, in terms of how, um, how people could pay for it, it, it would be similar to what the current metro system is right now, which is um, off bus or off train boarding. So you would, you know, either tap your go to card or, or buy a ticket. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, last question for, for the moment, unless someone adds one. Um, can Aaron expand the timeline for new ridership numbers post COVID and how it might affect the study process? All right, thank you for that question. Um, well, right now, as you know, that we are in um, our early phases of, of this uh, project. I know there was a slide um, used very early on in this presentation that talked about the overall project timeline. Is that possible that we could go back to that slide? 
projects. And so as you can see from right here, um, we are in the engineering and pre-environmental phase. And so we are in the year one of this particular aspect of the, of the, of the project. And so as we move through this phase, I would imagine that as we be able to get to um, before getting into that project development that we will be needing to look at um, updated ridership information before we're able to advance into the next phase of the project. Yeah, so we talked a little bit early about, you know, making sure the project is competitive and with other projects across the country to get funding and I didn't point out before, but these sort of orange starbursts here are FTA or Federal Transit Administration points of approval. And as Aaron said, you know, as we transition between phases, and this has been similar to other projects that are further along here in the region, the, the ridership is always being updated just based on new data and then, um, you know, changes to the the modeling, you know, that comes from from the FTA. So. It's a continuous effort. Do we have any other comments? Any, any, any my last call for questions at this point in the process? Get us to the end of the presentation again. Last call. Or anyone on the panel want to speak to any points? The only thing I'll, I'll add at this point is that following our, our open house meeting here, uh, our staff, our communication staff, will reach out again to the district councils, business associations, and other groups, and schedule another another round of update meetings to share further information with with those groups. And as I think, as we discussed earlier too, as as COVID restrictions lessen, we will be in in the community a lot more at pop up meetings and other and joining some of your other community events to share information about the project and answer questions uh, where you are, rather than bringing you to a virtual public meeting. And I was going to say this is a great opportunity to also um, plug a tool that we are going to launch soon. Um, it is an interactive comment mapping um, tool. And so we'll make that available and you'll hear more about it through social media, through the website, um, et cetera. We are set to, um, to uh, release the next um, uh, e-newsletter, um, probably a little bit after the holiday. Um, in, the, in a couple of weeks here. And um, so there'll be mention of this tool there possibly, quite possibly, um, we're still testing a couple things on it. And then um, it will also talk about the upcoming PAC meeting and, and things about that. And I will say my last plug for purpose and need, please review the document. Um, it's available uh, for review and comment. You can comment at uh, info at reviewed.corridor.com um, and it is available on the website for, um, for your perusal. Well, thank you everyone. If, if there are no further questions and uh, our panelists have nothing else to add, I think we can, we can end our meeting. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking time out on a really nice evening to be in front of your computer, probably in your, in your house, in your bedroom like I am, instead of being outside and enjoying the weather. Uh, we appreciate your, your input, your questions, and we hope we've answered your questions completely and, and as thoroughly as, as, uh, as you wanted us to. If not, please follow up with us, info at riverviewcorridor.com. Send us an email if you have a follow-up question. If you think of something later on after the meeting that you wished you'd asked here uh, but, but didn't, go ahead and, and send it to us in an email. Our social media is up too. We have Facebook and Twitter, as it was mentioned. You can ask us questions and comments in there. And... Uh, We'd, we'd love to hear from you, uh, hear from more comments and questions from you if, if you have any. All right, thank you. And uh, Commissioner Ortega has left the meeting a while ago. I, I, I'm not going to usurp his, uh, his uh, control here or rule here, but I think we can adjourn our meeting. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you hopefully in person in the near future to talk about Riverview and, and the project. Thank you. <laughs>